Hi, my name is Alexia. You're watching the Hot Weird Girl channel, and thank you for tuning in to my very first YouTube video. Like and subscribe, I already know you're gonna love it, and hopefully you're here for my TikTok. If not, if you just found this channel organically, welcome. So we're gonna jump right into the video. This past weekend, Sophia Richie, daughter of African-American icon and legendary singer Lionel Richie and Elliot Grange, son of Universal Music Group executive, got married in the south of France and it's been causing a lot of really interesting conversations. And as much as I love the style breakdowns of Sophia Richie and, you know, talking about the wedding accents and what a beautiful wedding it was, and let's be honest, a wedding that costs that much, probably in the millions, more than likely multi-millions, definitely should look good. So they hit every note there. But it's causing a lot of misinformed conversations about the idea of quiet luxury. And let's be honest, Sophia Richie is not the first person to usher in these conversations about quiet luxury. It's been a growing trend on TikTok, Pinterest, YouTube. People are very obsessed with the idea of looking wealthy, but in a quiet way. I recently posted a three-part TikTok series stating that there is no way to be quietly wealthy and what we're actually seeing is a misappropriation of fashion and American history. So I'm going to take you on that journey in a more in-depth version. Before we continue on, I encourage you to check out my TikTok, my Twitter, and my Instagram. I am super active on TikTok and Twitter. I would love if you gave me a follow. Let's get into it. All right, we're going way back in time to European history. In the Western world, more specifically Western Europe, wealth has always been associated with opulence and opulence has always been a flashing, screaming signal that this person is incredibly wealthy. The reason why these beautiful castles exist is because the nobility were attempting to communicate, look at how much money we have. And I would be remiss attempting to have a conversation about the opulence of the wealthy without talking about the most well-known example, the Palace of Versailles. Look at the footage of this palace if you haven't had the opportunity to go yourself. It's incredible, beautiful. Everything is dripping in ornate detail. It's literally breathtaking. It was also exorbitantly, ridiculously expensive. So for the European aristocracy and the nobility especially, wealth became a display of their power. And all of this was meant to convey the superiority that was assumed of the nobility. Think back to the doctrine of the divine right of kings. If you don't remember your European history, don't worry, I'll give you a little briefer. The divine right of kings was initially a political doctrine of Christian ideology that said that kings were essentially given their divine right to rule from God. Now, there are many political implications of this, the fact that parliament supposedly could not intervene with the will of God and could therefore not interfere with the will of the king, but also it communicated to the lower classes, the feudal classes, the peasants, that their right, and by their I mean the nobility, the rich, the right to live the way they did was from God. So by using their wealth to communicate how rich they were, they were also showing how blessed they were. And these blessings were confirmation of their superiority. And it's really important to keep this air of superiority in mind as we walk through this video. But even amongst the richest in Western Europe, there have always been divisions. And that's not something that's necessarily specific to Europe. We have evidence going all the way back to ancient Rome that people who had newly come into money were looked down upon by those who had money in their family for longer. Think about Jane Austen novels, Downton Abbey, again, these tensions between the established upper class and members of the upper class whose membership was newer. Now that we have that in our minds, it's time to jump to American history. So in the early 1600s, European colonizers came over to this land, which we now know as America, and began to steal the land of the inhabitants who had been here for thousands of years. And thus, America was born. If you were trying to take a test and use that information, I'm pretty sure you would fail. And if you were in Florida, I'm pretty sure you'd be kicked out of the state. 
But as British colonization began to occur over the northeast strip of North America, um, wealth began to become acquired. So through this process, people started to become incredibly wealthy. And with the introduction of enslaved people to the Americas and the transatlantic slave trade, that potential for wealth boomed. So suddenly, even before America was founded as a country, we had people who were becoming wealthy in this part of the world through the exploitation of enslaved Africans, stealing the lands of the indigenous and exporting crops. And so it's this earliest part in American history that influences what Americans think of as old money and new money. In America, oldest, oldest money is thought of as European nobility, the aristocracy, the classes that were investing their money into American colonization. Now that definition will change, but we'll get there. We're not there yet. So these newly rich pioneers were not embraced warmly by European nobility, and they never truly would be. On July 4th, 1776, America finally gained independence from England, and therefore the United States of America was born. And at that time, there were already incredibly wealthy people in this brand new baby country. In fact, most of the founders of this country, the men who came up with the Constitution, signed the Bill of Rights, who signed the Declaration of Independence, came from wealth. George Washington, yeah, first president George Washington, is the second richest president in American history, and he got those riches through um, his numerous plantations and through the enslavement of Africans. And this was a threat to European nobility. Remember at this time that France has undergone several revolutions at this point, which already threatened the stability of the monarchies in Europe. And then we have this brand new baby country, America, asserting military dominance and freeing itself from British colonial rule, asserting itself as a country. And also it's getting the backing of France who Remember, they're troublesome for European monarchy. But it wasn't just this political uprising that was troubling for the old guard, old money, old world. It was also the fact that they were demything. It's not a word, it's gonna be a word today. Demything the idea of the divine endowment of wealth. Technically, if we just ignore the human rights abuses, the men who signed the constitution were self-made. They didn't get their wealth because God said that their family was better than everyone else's and everyone had to pay taxes. They made it for themselves through exploitation, but they made it for themselves. That's a big problem. And that's sort of the beginning of this resentment. So at this point, I want you to understand that there are two moneyed groups going on. There is the old money, old guard of European nobility and aristocracy, who even amongst their quarrels in themselves, we're going to call them old money. And there's this burgeoning new money in America. Now, as America began to grow out of its infancy, these powerful founding families began to cement themselves as America's version of old money. But it's important to keep in mind through this video that in a global context, again, still pretty new money. And if there's anything you've learned at this point in the video, it's with the establishment of old money comes strict exclusionary definitions that make sure that anyone who isn't within the right generation will be considered as new money. So American old money and American new money really began to establish their quarrels in the wake of the Industrial Revolution. The Industrial Revolution in America really highlighted the tension between this old, we'll call him the founding father, old money, and this new money that was coming up on slave money, expansion into the West, and my favorite example, steel barons. If you didn't know this, I'm a Pittsburgh native. I was raised there all my life, although now I live in Philadelphia. And our city has absolutely been shaped by the Carnegies, the Mellons, the Fricks. Interestingly, all of these men were considered at their time to be American new money. For example, Carnegie was the son of an immigrant. Um, he ended up building this vast steel empire, selling it to JP Morgan and going on to found numerous legacies like Carnegie Mellon University, Carnegie Music Hall, Carnegie everything. 
but he was rejected by the old guard in America at the time, that founding father's money, because he was new. However, the one uniting feature between the old founding father's money and the new money is that they both attempted to assert their wealth through European luxury and taste. European, specifically Western European aesthetics were absolutely seen as the gold standard of how wealth should look, present, and how you should act. And there was a desperate attempt by marrying American heiresses into um, European noble families who needed money, by building structures that very closely monitored um, European architecture. For example, as I said, I'm from Pittsburgh and many of our oldest buildings are really shaped by European influences and European ideals because again, the steel barons wanted to show how rich they were by emulating European taste. Because American new money itself didn't really have its own identity or wasn't yet confident enough to establish its new identity, it still looked to the Western European European world to tell it how to think, act, and dress. And this is the part where fashion comes into play. In the history of most of the Western world, fashion has always been limited to those who have unlimited or very high means. And in Europe, that was pretty much always limited to nobility, aristocracy, and perhaps certain members of the merchant class. It goes back into that ideal of opulence, what you were wearing, how beautiful and flowy your dresses were, the intricate, ornate detail, the quality of the fabrics, all spoke to how much money you had. And baby, that was something absolutely that American new money wanted to get their hands on. But it wasn't just American new money that was getting its hands on fashion. The American slave trade popularized the global supply of cotton because without the American slave trade and the exploitation of Africans, there never could have been that amount of cotton produced because they were being exploited for their free labor. At the same time, the Industrial Revolution is occurring, which made production way easier, manufacturing certain materials way easier, things were coming out in a more elevated way, and so prices were beginning to lower. So for the first time in history, we had this means of production, shout out to my comrades, but we had this means of production that was making goods more accessible to the common people, and suddenly fashion was beginning to be less of a conversation between the monies, forget old money and new money, just the monies of the world. And regular people were beginning to partake in trend. So to contextualize where we are in this lecture, we're in the period of the American Industrial Revolution, which is commonly believed to be between the late 1870s to World War II, so the 1940s. But what you need to know about this period, particularly as it pertains to fashion, is that fashion was becoming something that was something the everyday consumer could partake in. And this was something that was embraced with gusto. In the late 1890s, Vogue published its first ever magazine. Now, Vogue was not the first fashion publication at the time, although it is today currently the most well-known and my personal favorite, not American Vogue though, but one of my personal favorites. Um, but what it did is make fashion more egalitarian. It would contribute to today what we call the democratization of fashion or the idea that fashion is for all. Because for the first time, everyday people were becoming privy to the style conversations coming between the very few in the fashion world and their main clientele, the moneyed people of the world. As much as Vogue is about wealth, luxury good, designer fashion, highlighting the affectations of the rich, it could not thrive without the attention of the everyday upper middle class, middle class, and lower classes. Because partaking, even experiencing that fashion is absolutely something that is for all of us and Vogue caters to that. Although they might seem like an exclusive publication, what's really exclusive to Vogue is the price point of the items in it. It absolutely markets itself. That is something that can be observed by all. So as fashion became more accessible to common people, as good style and good taste was no longer solely dictated by your price point, there began to become an anxiety of the rich. 
the upper classes that suddenly the way that they dressed or their specific patterns was no longer exclusive to them and no longer as powerful. Remember that wealth signifiers in this world, in our world, can only be seen as powerful if they're exclusive to the wealthy. And there is no better example of this than the fashion world's reaction to hip hop and fashion. We're about to jump way forward in modern history to the late 80s and the foundation of hip hop. In the late 80s and early 90s, hip hop was born and rappers absolutely began what we now know as flex culture. Rappers bragged all day, every day in those slow ass rap songs about wealth signifiers, luxury goods, luxury food, luxury vacation, having money, getting money, wearing money on your back. Rappers who were coming from the hood, who were coming from the streets, who had never had anything a day in their life, suddenly got money and were now throwing the most expensive brands on their body in a move that horrified and disgusted the fashion world. In the post Virgil Abloh, may he rest in peace, world, in the Kanye collaborations, ASAP Rockies and Rihanna's, it's almost hard to believe that there was a time when fashion was absolute, and when I say fashion, I mean luxury designer fashion, was absolutely disgusted with the idea of black people wearing their clothes. And to an extent that still goes out today, but I think they've discovered that the black dollar will take them far, farther than um, black outrage. I'm gonna make a whole separate video on that topic, stay tuned. But the reaction against black people wearing designer clothes was extreme. Obviously racism is the culprit, but just to go back to this class analysis, remember that the upper class uses wealth in a way to distinguish themselves and fashion is an expression of this distinguishment. Remember that as much as fashion is an art form, it is also political. You cannot unintertwine politics and fashion, they're like this. So we have um, this political statement of look how wealthy I am. And then we have the lowest cast in America who, you know, 30 years prior to the 80s were legally relegated to the back of the bus, the bottom of society, and had to fight for their right for basic freedoms and therefore democratized America. Um, through the civil rights movement. So this is fresh off the heels of civil unrest, fresh off of, you know, establishing that we are actually American citizens and now we're throwing on the uniform of the upper crust. Well, they were pissed. So pissed that designers in an attempt to dissuade rappers from wearing their brands would actually gift rappers clothing of their rival houses. So imagine Gucci sending an Armani suit to Jay-Z because let's just hope that Jay-Z is wearing Armani instead of us. That'll really piss off our clientele. Remember that old money, both in the European world, American old money and American new money who were almost uniformly white were always the preferred and catered to customer of designer brands. Immediately, as a way to reclaim their power, they began to brand how black people were styling themselves in luxury good as tacky, as gauche. Oh, it's too ostentatious. It's ghetto. It's hood fabulous. It was seen as derogatory and disgusting. Look at you flashing your labels on these clothes that these designers definitely made. And my favorite designer who epitomizes what we now know as logomania, as dripping down, as being fresh as fuck, is designer Dan. Although he's accepted and beloved in the fashion world today, he was like reviled for a very long time. If you don't know who Dapper Dan is, he's an African-American Harlem fashion icon. His storefront operating on the streets of Harlem, New York, single-handedly introduced hip hop to luxury fashion. I say luxury because low key, he was counterfeiting that shit. <laughs> it looked great. It still looked great. His store, which operated from 1982 until 1992, served people like salt and Peppa, Jay-Z, LL Cool J. He was known for a flamboyant, eclectic, really flashy style that got him ostracized from other seamstresses, tastemakers who were all notably white. He's really cool and if you want a separate video about him, leave a comment in the- wait, leave a comment in the comments below? That was my first time saying that. But Dapper Dan's fashion outfits like this were seen as loud and therefore comes the concept of quiet luxury. Therefore emerged this perception that old money, 
European old money, American old money just knew better than to throw tacky labels on themselves. They weren't like those people, all right, people. They were more refined. They had more taste. Even if they were wearing the same brands as us, they knew how to wear it better. Again, remember, this is rooted in anxiety and class wealth signifiers because somehow flashing logos on your body and showing just exactly how dripped art you were, uh, maybe even shouting out how expensive your watch was, shouting out how expensive your shoes were, how nice everything is, suddenly that was too opulent, which is rich coming from a group of people who European old money are absolutely some of the most dripped out people in history, or at least in Western history. And then because American old money continually wanted to emulate the style aesthetics of European old money, they just adopted this as well. In addition to the American racism and things that are going into this pot, you get where I'm going. What the upper classes realize is that they couldn't distinguish themselves by price. If they couldn't even distinguish themselves by brand, then they would distinguish themselves in simply the superiority of taste. What the upper classes realize is that the accessibility of designer goods or simply the ability to counterfeit and boost designer goods would always mean that certain brands, certain price points would never become or could never serve as the only barrier. Instead, it had to be about superiority of taste, knowing how to wear things correctly, properly, and conveniently in a way that really only benefited white money. To okay, so we've just gone through a little bit of European history, a little bit of American history. We're talking about hip hop and fashion history, but how does this exactly pertain to Sophia Richie's wedding? I will tell you. I have seen so many TikToks insisting that Sophia Richie's wedding is quiet luxury. W Magazine even read that or ran that headline. Oh, look at Sophia Richie's quiet luxury wedding. Sophia Richie wore three couture gowns by Chanel, hand beaded, hand sewn. She had to go continuously back and forth between the couture halls of Paris and her home in LA, Hawaii, wherever else she and her now husband have houses to get these dresses customized. She had Vogue come in and film every moment of her wedding and she's likely hired a at least million dollar PR campaign to propel her into the it girl spotlight. There was nothing quiet about this wedding. So why is it being read as quiet? Disregarding the fact. Did my ring light just go out? What's important to understand is that the trends of old money and the upper 1% classes is that it will always be fueled by the anxiety that they are not properly distinguishing themselves and asserting their superiority over the lower classes. And so all the wealth markers that they adopt are in part fueled by the anxiety that they need to appear and seem different and therefore superior in order to maintain their power over the government, over society, um, and dictating tastes in our culture. And in turn, the lower classes will attempt to emulate the upper classes in a mistaken attempt in believing that adopting these wealth signifiers will somehow make you actually wealthy. And because the lower classes have continuously and continue to be obsessed with what old money is doing, therefore we get these old money trend TikToks. I literally saw this girl say that she saw Sophia Richie using an old money lip pencil. Be so fucking for real. Be so fucking for real. What is an old money lip pencil? People really believe that throwing that bald, bald, beige Zara blazer on and a pair of slacks is going to make you old money. Because the lower classes are consumed with adopting the wealth signifiers of the upper classes in a mistaken attempt, again, at believing that you can go on these vacation spots and you can wear this beige Zara blazer and you can throw on a pair of slacks and you can go sit at a nice hotel bar and you can do all these things that somehow you'll be able to trick yourself into believing you're part of the upper class. But at this point, the upper classes have adopted a sense of fashion that's more need to know. Have you ever seen that meme of Bill Gates wearing a plain sweater, some jeans and some sneakers? And there's usually some misinformed tagline like, look, 
Bill Gates dresses just like us, when in reality, Bill Gates is spending an exorbitant amount of money, thousands on that sweater, thousands on those pants, and thousands on those ugly sneakers to appear as one of us because that is currently the new flex. If they cannot distinguish themselves via cut, pattern logo, then they'll distinguish themselves by wearing regular clothes that are subtly better. I want you to think of the example The Row, which was founded by Mary-Kate and Ashley and is a very beautiful brand. It focuses on a lot of neutrals, basics, but it is exorbitantly expensive. And part of the appeal is not just that it's basics that should theoretically last forever, but that it's at such a high price point that it automatically communicates exclusivity. Things on the row, each piece is thousands of dollars, which is just unattainable for most people, especially those people who may use their thousands of dollars to buy something more flashy, because why would you spend thousands of dollars on a t-shirt? You spend thousands of dollars on a t-shirt so that other people who also want to spend thousands of dollars on a t-shirt will look at your specific cut, the hemming, because trust me, if there's one thing I've learned from my little sister who's a fashion major at Kent, it's that rich people are very well adept at recognizing cut color fabric, I guess because they've been exposed to it so often, um, but it's so that other people can clock what you're wearing and go, oh, that's from the row. And if they don't wear if you're not wearing that brand, even if you're wearing the exact same fit, they don't clock it. And this desire of the rich to wear non-flashy but still highly clockable, extremely expensive pieces is right now in 2023 how many of the upper class are asserting their wealth. And that's what's leading people to mistake minimalism for quiet luxury because Minimalism on you and I, even when it's a basic from Aritzia, is not going to communicate old fashioned luxury like a t-shirt from the row. And let's be honest, you probably don't have that type of dispensable income to wear the row. And again, you know what I'm gonna say at this point if you've been paying attention to the lecture, that's what makes it so desirable by its clientele. So Sophia Ritchie in her somewhat subdued wedding dress, because it's beautiful and even ornate, but it's still on the simpler side for celebrity wedding dresses, and more of a classic silhouette, is communicating what people interpret as quiet luxury, because people are noting the simplicity and the classicness of the design. In reality, what people are really communicating when they look at Sophia Ritchie who is absolutely, by any stretch of the imagination, new money. Lionel Richie is the first one in her family to get that type of wealth. And part of the appeal of this everyday but yet still super expensive thing is that regular people can look at it and not know how expensive it is and that's part of the flex. So Sophia Richie being communicated as quiet luxury, it's not astute to call Sophia Richie quiet luxury because she's in a more, I don't even want to say minimalist, but again, slightly more subdued aesthetic. It's just communicating your absolute lack of fashion knowledge. It's communicating the fact that you don't know how expensive a couture Chanel wedding dress is. And that is now the signifier between actual old money and new money. The point of this video was to communicate to you that the trends of old money, this insatiable desire on TikTok to get it, will one, never work because the moment anyone actually gets close to emulating rich aesthetics, they simply have the money to get up and pick a new aesthetic that is now unattainable to the masses. But two, you're proving their point that you simply just don't have that innate taste to clock what is actually an exorbitantly expensive outfit or exorbitantly expensive pieces. I love saying exorbitantly expensive. It just rolls off the tongue. You have to understand that in America, the old money has simply always been emulating what European old money does. And ultimately, they want nothing to do with any of us. And that they will continuously and always 
find ways to differentiate themselves, that they absolutely hate the fact that everyone else wants to be them while secretly enjoying that superiority complex, and that this conversation about how you and I can engage in quiet luxury will automatically be cost prohibitive, which is the point right now of luxury. Okay, I think that's all I have to say on the topic for now, but knowing me, I'll probably come back with a part two. Um, if you've made it to the end of the video, thank you so much. It really means so much to me that you've stuck around, you've watched it. I would love to have a conversation with you in the comments. I know there were so many other topics I could have expanded upon, but I just kind of wanted to give um, a brief historical snapshot so that we could engage in this conversation together. And again, I know I already said it, but I am so, so glad you're here. Please like and subscribe this video, and I would really appreciate it if you would share it with at least two people in your life who you know would like it. Every little bit helps me right now. All the links to my socials are down below. Please leave a comment, and until next time.